Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's online seminar hosted by the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. My name is Kirsten Sainbrook, and I am a Distinguished Policy Fellow at the LSE International Inequalities Institute and a Global Professor at the British Academy. I am incredibly pleased today to be chairing this event on Prioritarianism in Practice, which is part of the III's Inequalities Seminar Series. Today's speakers are Professor Matthew Adler and Professor Francisco Ferreira. Professor Matthew Adler is Matthew D. Adler, sorry, is Richard um, A. Horvitz Professor of Law and Professor of Economics, Philosophy and Public Policy at Duke University, and is the founding director of the Duke Center for Law, Economics and Public Policy. His scholarship is interdisciplinary, drawing from welfare economics, normative ethics, and legal theory. Adler's current research focuses on prioritarianism, a refinement to utilitarianism that gives extra weight, i.e. priority, to the worse off. He is editor of the new volume, Prioritarianism in Practice, together with Orle Norheim. Francisco H.G. Ferreira, is the Amartya Sen Professor of Inequality Studies and Director of the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics. He is also affiliated with the Department of Social Policy at the LSE. He co-authored the chapter Prioritarianism and Equality of Opportunity in this new volume alongside Paolo Brunori and Vito Peragine. In this event, as this event is a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar, we can see our audience. So therefore we can have an interactive event and we would like to ask you to keep your microphones off but your videos on wherever possible. As usual there will be a chance to ask questions following the presentations of the speakers. Please do so by raising your hand in your Zoom function or directly asking your question in the chat if you prefer. In both cases please state your name and affiliation. The next event in the Inequality Seminar series is entitled Of Victims, Sisters and Caring, Anti-Trafficking State and the Sex Workers Movement in Sonagachi in India. And it will take place at 12.30 to 1.30 next Tuesday on the 7th of June. A link to this event will be posted in the chat along with information on more upcoming events. I will now hand over to Matthew. Many thanks to all of you for being here and I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty, for that nice introduction. Um, thank you to the International Inequalities Institute uh, for hosting uh, the seminar and thank you all for uh, attending. Um, okay, so... Um, Hope you guys can see that. Um, so uh, prioritarianism um, is an ethical view uh, pioneered uh, by the philosopher Derek Parfit in the 1990s. Um, unlike utilitarianism, you know, which I assume we're all familiar with, uh, which maximizes total well-being, uh, prioritarianism gives extra weight to well-being changes affecting worse off individuals. Um, and there's now actually a quite substantial uh, philosophical literature, both book literature uh, and journal literature in philosophy on prioritarianism. Prioritarianism can be formalized as a specific family of social welfare functions, SWFs. Um, the uh, social welfare function methodology, again, many people uh, um, uh, uh, in the seminar may be familiar, others may not be, but in any event, uh, this is a methodology which is rooted in theoretical welfare economics um, and it's widely used in certain economic literatures, uh, for example, optimal tax theory. Um, that methodology has three key components. First, there's a well being measure, uh, this W here, which converts the possible outcomes of policy choice. Um, and let me say, by policy choice, I mean anything the government might do building infrastructure passing tax legislation, uh, enacting regulations, um, you know, any kind of policy government might uh, enact. Outcomes here are social outcomes, right? Everything that might happen 
um, uh, you know, in terms of health, longevity, uh, income, uh, and so forth to people in the population of interest. So this SWF methodology uh, is a way to sort of um, uh, a formalize policy assessment of that. Uh, and so outcomes are converted uh, into uh, well-being vectors, that is lists of well-being numbers. So outcome X becomes uh, the list of num numbers W1X, that's the well-being of individual one in outcome X, all the way up to WNX, the well-being of individual N. Having then, you know, uh, summarized uh, um, uh, all the information uh, uh, about a particular possible outcome uh, in terms of this list of well-being numbers, uh, uh, the methodology then uses a rule uh, for ranking these well-being vectors, which is the SWF proper. And here is where prioritarianism comes into play. Uh, the utilitarian rule is simply this, just a simple sum of the well-being numbers, uh, while the prioritarian rule uh, sums well-being plugged into an increasing and concave uh, transformation. Um, the effect of that is to give priority to the worse off. So this shows the idea, right? So this is, um, you know, a possible transformation function, right? Um, it's uh, uh, it's in key, uh, increasing, but it's concave. It sort of bends over, right? Um, and if you think uh, about a pure transfer of well-being from someone who is better off to someone who is worse off, right? So WH means someone who is at a higher level of well-being, WL, someone at a lower level of well-being, and let's imagine just a transfer of well-being of delta W from the better off person to the worse off person. Now, of course, you know, if this is utilitarianism and we have a pure transfer of well-being, right, that's a matter, you know, for the utilitarian of ethical indifference, right? The sum total of well-being with this kind of pure transfer does not change at all, right? But if we're prioritarian, so we have this concave function here, right? the effect of a pure transport is to increase uh, the sum total of transformed well-being, right? And you can see this graphically, right? So the transformed well-being, this G number here for the better off one goes down by this, but because this transformation function is concave, right? The transformed well-being of the worse off one increases by more. And so the sum total of transformed well-being goes up with this pure transfer of well-being from a better off to a worse off person, right? And this is the critical idea which is used in this social welfare function, you know, framework to formalize the notion of prioritarianism, right? Again, prioritarianism is sort of a philosophical idea, right? But we can express it formally, right? By summing, again, not just simply summing well-being, but by summing transformed well-being, that is well-being plugged into this concave uh, uh, transformation function. So in 2015, uh, Ola Norheim, who is a, uh, you know, uh, uh, eminent uh, medical doctor and public health researcher at the University of Berg Ber uh, Bergen uh, in Norway, uh, he and I organized uh, the Prioritarianism in Practice PIP Research Network uh, to spearhead research into the use of prioritarian social warfare functions as a policy analysis tool and as a metric of social condition. Um, and the work of the network has now been published as a book, uh, um, you know, just uh, very recently by Cambridge University Press. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'll briefly talk about uh, prioritarianism within the space of social welfare functions. I'll give an overview uh, of the book, quick overview, uh, and then I'll discuss uh, one example uh, from uh, the book. Okay, so again, this shows the idea of uh, prioritarianism um, as a social welfare function. That's the book, got a nice cover. Um, okay, so again, let me first talk about um, prioritarianism as one type of social welfare function, right? If you think about it, right, you know, we've, 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 we're thinking about policies um, uh, um, um, as, um, I should have said this on the first slide, let me just back, I sort of skipped over this, right? So we can think of policies um, if you think of a particular policy, um, you know, you may not know for sure, right? The decision maker, you know, probably will not know for sure uh, what outcome will result from the policy. Um, but, um, um, you know, uh, uh, hopefully she at least can think of outcomes as sort of probability distributions over, 
um, uh, 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 sorry, you think of policies as probability distributions over outcomes, uh, and then we convert the outcomes into these well-being vectors. Okay, so let me just focus now on this space of, you know, uh, social welfare functions, that is different rules for ranking these uh, well-being vectors. Um, you know, one of the nice things about uh, the literature uh, on uh, theoretical welfare economics is that, that it uses uh, different axioms, uh, you know, uh, to think about welfare economics, and particularly here to think about uh, different possible social welfare functions. Uh, so, um, um, you know, these are axioms, these are sort of possible uh, um, uh, constraints uh, 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 that the social welfare functions would satisfy. Uh, uh, we're imagining here just for simplicity a four person population. These are well being numbers, right? So imagine we got four people, right? Uh, so, in one outcome, you know, person one uh, is at uh, uh, level three, person two is at level four, person three is at level 10. Person four is at 13. Uh, this symbol means better than. This symbol means equally good as. So um, the strong Pareto axiom says, if we make at least one person better off and no one worse off, that's an ethical improvement, right? So in this case, strong Pareto, you see uh, a person four goes from level 12 to level 13 and the other three people were unaffected. Uh, strong Pareto says in that case, right, um, 3, 4, 10, 13 is an improvement over 3, 4, 10, 12. Um, anonymity or impartiality says, you know, if we have a, a list of well-being numbers and we just rearrange them, right, we, we simply, we don't change the overall pattern, we simply change which particular person is at a given well-being level, right? So here, you know, we start with 7, 12, 4, and 60. And we just spin that around uh, to 12, 60, 4, 7. Uh, impartiality says that that should be a matter of uh, ethical uh, uh, indifference. In welfare economics, you know, strong Pareto uh, and anonymity are, are, you know, very uncontroversial, right? Strong Pareto says, you know, uh, if you can make some better off, you know, uh, and none worse off, well, of course you should do that. Uh, anonymity um, uh, expresses, you know, the ethical idea of uh, impartiality, right? Um, if we have the very same pattern, why should it matter ethically which particular person is at which particular um, well-being level? Um, uh, then there are three other axioms which are um, a little more controversial. Uh, Pigu Dalton, which is an equity axiom. Uh, I already, you know, alluded to this in talking about that graph earlier. So Pigu Dalton says, um, if we have a pure transfer of well-being from someone better off to someone worse off, right, um, uh, that should be an ethical improvement, right? So in this case, um, if we start with this vector on the right, person three is at 10, person two is at four, and we transfer two units of well-being, right? So person two goes from four to six, Person three goes from 10 to eight. Pigu Dalton says that's uh, an ethical improvement. That should be better. Um, separability says that if we're comparing two outcomes and some people are, are unaffected, that is, these people have the very same well being levels in both outcomes, it shouldn't matter what the particular well being level is, right? So, in terms of numbers, note that. You know, as between these two outcomes, individual one goes from seven to four, uh, individual four goes from seven to 12, but the middle two individuals are at the same well-being levels, right? Individual two is at 100 on each outcome, uh, and individual three is at 100 in each outcome, right? And separability then says, well, it shouldn't matter whether these unaffected people are at level 100 or at some other level, right? So if instead the level were seven, right, um, the ranking should be the same. And then finally, continuity says, if we, if one uh, outcome is better than a second, then that's gonna be true for a sufficiently small region around uh, uh, the first outcome, right? So if one, three, 50,000, 50,000 is better than one, three, six, eight, then that should be true for sufficiently small epsilon right, around 1, 3, 50,000, 50, 
Now, you know, it's interesting to think about these and whether, you know, we like these axioms or not, um, whether we endorse them. Uh, but they're also highly relevant to prioritarianism. Um, you know, what turns out to be the case, if this is not obvious, uh, uh, um, is that these fi five axioms characterize the prioritarian family of social welfare functions. That is, every prioritarian social welfare function satisfies all five. And conversely, it can be shown that if a social welfare function satisfies all five, it must be prioritarian. So P. Dalton, again, the, the, this, equ this equity axiom is what separates utilitarianism and prioritarianism. Right, so utilitarianism, as already noted, does not satisfy Pigou Dalton, but utilitarianism satisfies the other four, right? So, um, uh, but again, one way to think about whether you know uh, you like whether you'd endorse sort of ethically endorse prioritarianism is by thinking about whether you'd endorse all five of these axioms. If you do so, you are then automatically a prioritarian, right? Um, if, on the other hand, um, uh, you induce uh, you endorse four but not Pigou Dalton then you're a utilitarian and it's really then Pigou Dalton, which is the pivot point for the debate between utilitarianism and uh, prioritarianism. Um, this shows you know, the same um, sort of axiomatic di division, uh, but just sort of graphically, right? So you can think about um, you know, the uh, axioms of separability and continuity um, you know, for reasons I can talk about in Q&A if we get to it, um, separability and continuity uh, having those as axioms significantly increase the tractability of this methodology, right? If we're thinking about this as a methodology for policy choice, then it'd be nice if it's, you know, usable or more easy to use. Separating continuity help do that, right? Um, and then within the space of separable and co continuous social welfare functions, we can think about whether to endorse this equity axiom, which is good Alton, um, um, uh, or uh, not. Um, uh, if you like separability and continuity, um, then the social welfare function takes this general sort of additive form, right? The sum of some function f of well being, where f is increasing and continuous. Um, and then within that family, uh, you know, in the book, we call these generalized utilitarian social welfare functions. Utilitarianism is one example of that. Prioritarianism uh, is another example. Those would seem to be the most plausible examples. Okay, so here is the um, book, um, uh, and then I'll you know uh, quickly get to uh, an example. Um, so, you know, I uh, was very very privileged to be able to cooperate with this this fantastic team of um, uh, economists, uh, international team of economists. Uh, uh, public health research, uh, researchers, philosophers. Um, uh, so uh, the book uh, has a bunch of theory chapters. Um, there's you know, a general theory chapter about prioritarianism. There's also a theory chapter about um, well-being measurement. Uh, 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 Francisco um, uh, with Paolo Bernori and Vito Perugin uh, 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 wrote a theory chapter about um, equality of opportunity. He'll get to that in a sec. Um, uh, um, uh, and then the book, uh, you know, in a way, the core of the book is about applying prioritarianism to different specific policy domains, right? Because again, uh, what we're really trying to do here is to think about uh, uh, how prioritarianism uh, um, applies to different important domains of governmental policy choice. So um, um, we cover you know, um, a tax policy, uh, health policy, fatality risk regulation, uh, climate policy, education. Um, and, you know, as we were uh, drafting this, you know, uh, uh, the disaster of COVID-19 occurred. And so we added a chapter um, Madalena Ferrano, J.P. Sibilla, and David Bloom, you know, did a very quick work uh, and great work in drafting a chapter on the application of prioritarianism uh, to COVID-19 policy. Um, there's also a chapter, chapter five, on measuring social progress. Um, you know, the standard measure of social condition and social progress uh, is a GDP. Um, so that chapter looks at how social welfare functions, in particular prioritarian social welfare functions, uh, uh, might instead be used uh, as a metric of uh, social progress. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a chapter 
looking at um, you know empirical research and ethical preferences um, uh, and looking at the extent to which uh, individuals actually endorse um, you know the axioms that define prioritarianism. Um, uh, this is just some quick you know uh, other points about the book. Um, uh, this social work function framework uh, does depend on having not just a social welfare function, but this well-being measure, right? So uh, one of the chapters is about how to construct that uh, well-being uh, uh, measure. Here, you know, as in other places in the book, we're really drawing upon and synthesizing uh, existing research. Um, you know, uh, one issue, of course, is how you pick this function. I mean, there are many, many different possible, you know, concave transformation functions. Um, two such uh, functions um, are particularly uh, widely used. Uh, each, you know, has a very simple form, has a single parameter uh, for sort of um, uh, fixi fixing uh, the shape of the transformation function. One is the so-called Atkinson uh, prioritarian social welfare function, right, named for uh, um, uh, the great economist of inequality, Anthony Atkinson, um, which takes the form transformed well-being is one over one minus gamma times well-being to the power of one minus gamma. And this gamma parameter is the degree of priority for the worse off. So as gamma becomes bigger and bigger, um, you know, uh, the function becomes more and more concave, more and more relative weight is given to the worse off. Uh, another kind of standard prioritarian function uh, is the so-called cohn pollock uh, function. These are the two that are used uh, in uh, the book. What the book chapters generally do, right, in uh, the policy chapters um, and the social condition chapter uh, is to compare the implications of utilitarianism and prioritarianism. Um, you know, utilitarianism has been, you know, in a way the leading approach to policy analysis uh, uh, for many, many years. Uh, and so we want to, you know, uh, drill down on prioritarianism, uh, uh, but to deeper understanding of that by looking at how it compares to utilitarianism. Uh, we also try to uh, compare both utilitarianism and prioritarianism to, you know, whatever may be the standard approaches within the policy domain. So, for example, uh, risk regulation, which we'll talk about in a second briefly, um, you know, the, the standard policy tool uh, uh, is, uh, at least in the U.S., is cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so that chapter looks uh, at utilitarianism, prioritarianism, uh, 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 by contrast with uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, with respect to health policy, uh, cost-effectiveness analysis is very important. So the health chapter, um, you know, looks at utilitarianism, prioritarianism, uh, as well as uh, cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, the chapters try to both summarize existing research on prioritarianism. There is existing research, you know, in, in the various domains, uh, but also to a very significant extent, uh, they undertake uh, new analysis. Okay, this will just give you, this will be quick, because um, I want to be sure to leave time for uh, Professor Vera's uh, presentation and, and questions. Uh, this is just an example from the um, risk regulation uh, chapter. Uh, uh, this is a case study which is taken uh, uh, from my 2019 book, which is discussed in that chapter and gives a flavor of the results there. Um, there's a simulation model which is based on the U.S. survival curve. You know, a survival curve shows for individuals as a function of age. Um, you know, the probability of surviving, uh, you know, each uh, succeeding year of life, right? So if you're aged 30, what's your probability of surviving to 31? Condition on surviving five into 31, the probability of surviving to 32 and so forth, right? This, you know, this kind of information uh, that statistical agencies collect. Uh, so based on that information and the U.S. income distribution, um, uh, we modeled uh, uh, the population as divided into 25 different uh, groups. So five different age groups, um, um, uh, and then each age group subdivided into uh, uh, five different uh, income groups based upon the actual uh, uh, 10th, 30th, 50th, 70th, and 90th percentiles of the U.S. population. Um, and um, we then imagined, 
you know, kind of a standard, uh, uh, a stylized example of a fatality risk reduction policy, right? Um, so we imagine that the policy here reduces everyone's risks, right? Reduces risks uh, across the cohorts by one in a hundred thousand. Um, this, by the way, this chapter was written, or this, this example was written before COVID. So if you thought about sort of typical pre-COVID fatality risk reduction policies, like anti-pollution policies or transportation safety policies, one in a hundred thousand would be sort of a standard, you know, uh, order of magnitude for risk reduction. Um, and then we said, okay, so using uh, the, the different methodologies, so using utilitarianism, using prioritarianism, here we used this Atkinson uh, prioritarian uh, transformation function. So gamma represents, gamma two, sorry, represents kind of a moderate degree of priority for the worse off. Uh, uh, and then finally using cost benefit analysis, um, we said, if we imagined a uh, uniform one in a hundred thousand risk reduction uh, for everyone in these, you know, 25 age income groups, what is the break-even cost, right? I mean, if you think about it, if, if we could do that for nothing, then of course that would be a good idea. Uh, if reducing everyone's risks by one in a hundred thousand, um, you know, at a massive cost, but if, if that were only possible at a massive cost, then on balance, it would probably not be a good idea. Um, so what's the break-even cost, right? What is the um, largest average cost, right, for individuals in 25 groups, such that if the policy costs are below that, the policy is, you know, seen as a good thing. If the policy costs are above that, it's seen as a bad thing. Now, um, and we did that for, for cost-benefit analysis, utilitarianism, prioritarianism. As you can see here, the numbers are, are quite different, <laughs> right? Um, so cost-benefit is willing to um, you know, go for this risk reduction up to uh, um, an average cost of $91 per person. Uh, utilitarianism um, has a lower break-even. Prioritarianism is in between. Um, so I'm not going to have time to go over what, what's driving this, but this just illustrates the use of these, you know, uh, um, techniques uh, as policy evaluation methodologies. Um, part of, you know, what's driving it um, is the way in which the different methodologies value fatality risk reduction. So if we start here with utilitarianism, right, this shows the value, the, the utilitarian value, right, utilitarianism is the sum of well-being, right, um, of a one in a hundred thousand risk reduction, and we normalize this, so one means the, the value, the utilitarian value of a one in a hundred thousand risk reduction to a 60-year-old low-income person. So what you can see here, I mean, just looking at it, uh, and by the way, I'm happy to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, for anyone to download these slides, um, is that the utilitarian numbers, first of all, uh, increase as individuals get younger. There is more, um, you know, uh, 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 expected lifetime well-being, which is saved by preventing uh, the death of a younger person as opposed to an older person. Uh, the utilitarian numbers uh, also increase uh, uh, within each age group, uh, group by income, right? Utilitarianism says there's more uh, value in reducing a risk to a younger, to, an, uh, to a richer person as opposed to a poorer person. That latter point is something which is, I think, pretty counterintuitive and intuitively objectionable. Prioritarianism, because it gives priority to those who are worse off, you know, meaning in particular here, those who are at lower income, prioritarianism with a sufficient degree of priority for the worse off, right, actually prefers to deliver risk reductions to the uh, uh, to lower income as opposed to higher income individuals within each age group. Prioritarianism uh, um, uh, intensifies the preference for the young here. So the prioritarian numbers, um, uh, go up uh, as individuals get younger, even more steeply than utilitarianism. Um, and uh, both of these differ significantly from cost-benefit analysis, which again is actually the dominant uh, approach in, in uh, practice. All right, let me stop there.
uh, and um, you know, happy to take questions uh, uh, in the uh, Q and A. Okay, um, so I guess I guess it's uh, my turn now. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, let me share uh, my screen. Uh, can you? Can, can you guys see that, Kirsten? Yeah, great, okay. So yeah, so this is um, just a short presentation, I get 10, 15 minutes of one of the chapters in, in Matt's and Oliver's book. Um, I was very grateful to Matt for uh, involving us in that, in that project. We learned a lot. Um, and this is joint work with, um, with Paolo, who's here, and with uh, our co-author, Vito Peragine. And so, you know, it's a long chapter. I'm going to summarize it as briefly as I can. The question we're asking in this chapter, which as Matt says, is a theory chapter, was can uh, prioritarianism, and I'm going to talk about welfareism sometimes, by which I mean utilitarianism and prioritarianism combined. So can welfareism be reconciled with this approach uh, called equality of opportunity? And the departing point, you know, so this is an exercise in normative welfare economics, which, as Matt um, sort of hinted at, is, a, you know, the, is the exercise of assessing alternative outcomes, alternative worlds, if you like. And in, in our case, alternative worlds will basically be distributions, alternative distributions. So you want to rank them according to some explicit normative criteria. We want to find out whether a certain policy makes a distribution better than another. Um, or whether there's a change over time, or whether one country can be compared to another. So it's about understanding, ranking, and ordering worlds. And these worlds will be simplified here as, as distributions. And of course, as, as Matt said, the default for that in, in economics has long been utilitarianism, which is just the sum of well-being here, right? Um, you know, Amartya Sen said that was the default program in welfare economic analysis. What we usually have in the back of our minds, even if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, explicitly invoke it. Okay, and and two things about this: it it only uses well-being. Um, that's the the space of information that you need is individual well-being, and it aggregates them by simply adding them up. Now, this has been an enormously influential and very long-lived uh, approach. It goes back to Bentham in the 18th century. Um, Bentham who was up at uh, UCL, uh, and um, but of course it's been criticized uh, widely by 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 many people, uh, particularly in the 20th century. And 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 this book looks at two critiques. One critique is the prioritarian critique. Um, you know, Matt mentioned the philosophers, uh, the literature beginning with Derek Parfit. Economists had also worked on this um, quite early on. Uh, just saying, well, if the distribution of well-being matters, then that summation, that simple summation is, is undesirable, right? We, we'd like to have um, something else, and, and that something else has this form, which Matt has already said. And the key thing here is that there's a transformation function that takes well-being, and it's increasing but concave. So I won't spend any time on that because Matt showed that graph and everything. So, so this is one critique which is okay, it's a critique about the aggregation rule. Uh, utilitarianism just simply adds stuff. That means that if you transfer from rich to poor people, nothing happens. We don't like that. We'd like an improvement if that happens. So prioritarianism is that. An alternative critique is, uh, which has taken many different forms and is perhaps somewhat deeper or more involved is that actually just looking at the vector of well-being, just looking at outcomes in terms of well-being may not be the right space to look at. Perhaps we should be looking at choice sets, opportunity sets, rather than the choices themselves. And if you do that, uh, one of the things that will turn out to happen as a consequence is that different kinds of inequalities in well-being or in outcomes will, will matter differently. So inequalities driven by the choice sets are gonna matter more than inequalities driven by choices you've made given a choice set. So there's a whole bit, you know, this is also not, not unrelated to, to sense capabilities, 
uh, approach, but there's uh, many philosophers who've worked and economists who've worked on the area of equality of opportunity, which argues that the right space to, to focus on is the space of opportunities. And that um, generates two sort of principles. W one is the principle of compensation, which says you should compensate people for differences in their choice sets. So, so if there are circumstances that people don't control that determine their choice sets, like their family background, their race, their gender, whatever, uh, then those inequalities are unfair and should be compensated. But if, if uh, inequalities are due to sort of your own responsibility, your choices, your efforts, then, there's, then it's okay uh, to preserve those. And there are various different versions of this. And in this talk, uh, I'm only going to be able to talk about one, so I'm going to be looking at what for the con cognoscenti. I'm going to be talking about ex ante uh, compensation and inequality averse reward, but um, you know, be that as it may. Um, so our question is this. There are these two views, which actually can be quite appealing, right? I mean, I like both these views. I think, I suspect a number of people may like both of them. One is this normative view one here. Poorer people deserve priority in the design of public policy. That's effectively prioritarianism. Another one says inequalities due to these predetermined circumstances, race, sex, family background, are worse and deserve more compensation than inequalities due to differences in responsibility and effort. You may still dislike inequality due to these things, but, but, but the, the, other, the, the first kind is worse, okay? So the question is, are these two consistent? You know, one might like them to be consistent. Are they consistent? And the answer is they're not consistent. Uh, but they can be made consistent a little bit. So this is what we try to do in this chapter. So, so here um, are those five axioms that Matt has already described. And he's described them in detail, so I don't need to go over them again. But I'm just going to remind you of anonymity and Pigou Dalton. Right? Anonymity means you just swap around the well-being levels in the distribution. You know, you permute the vector, nothing changes. Pigo Dalton means you make a transfer from a poorer to a richer person, well-being goes down, okay? All right, um, remember that, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, let me now show you a little bit how we think of the quality of opportunity stuff. So this slide is a little bit busy, forget all this text over here, just look at this matrix here, this little table. Th this is the way that, people in this theory organize you know, society. Instead of a vector of well-being levels, W1, W2, W3, now it matters a little bit what your circumstances are. So instead of a vector, we have a matrix where this, each row in this matrix is what we, we call a type. It's a group of people that share the same circumstances. So it might be, for example, um, Afro-Caribbean immigrants, born to highly educated parents, but mothers who worked in manual occupations in the UK. So some group, some social group, but which is defined by things that people could not control. Circumstances, race, sex, family background, place of birth, things like that. And within each of these, these people share the same circumstances but they may have different levels of well-being and their levels of well-being are increasing in effort. So there's some index E here that measures you know, differences in effort or responsibility. Uh, so there's inequality between the types, which is between the rows, and inequality within types and between these columns, these trenches. Okay. So the clash between the two, the two things that we're interested in prioritarianism and equality of opportunity arises because of the following. It's, you know, as types get richer, okay, um, people get richer along these, 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 these uh, uh, um, columns, basically. And within each type, people get richer with effort. So consider these two people, A and B, okay? A is in a richer type, but B, exerts more effort. So it's quite possible that A is poorer than B. Now, the principle of compensation that I talked about earlier, principle of compensation means that we have to reduce inequality in the values of these opportunity sets. We have to bring the types closer together. We have to make the types closer. So 
there should be a transfer from A to B. That would be a good thing under equality of opportunity. But if B is richer than A, then that transfer violates Pigou Dog. And, and, and so it's a bad thing from the point of view of prioritarianism. So there's a clash between the two, okay? So then the question, and I'm going quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but so then the question is, right, there is a clash. Can we reconcile them? Can we save something from these two perspectives that we like? And, and the answer is yes, provided we make some changes to those two axioms, anonymity and Pigou Dalton. What changes? Well, turns out that you have to replace anonymity across the whole population with two different kinds of anonymity. One is anonymity within a type. So just within those rows of the matrix, I can still, if I permute those people, if I, if I change around entries within a row of the matrix, then, then, um, then there's no, no change in, 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 in well-being. So we, we, you know, the, we, we, we are indifferent between, in between the two. Similarly, if I swap the types, if I just swap the lab labels of the types, um, uh, you know, so the distributions stay the same, but they, they, they are for different groups. That's also uh, an anonymity. So there's no anonymity individually between groups, but there is these two kinds of anonymity. I also have to replace the Pigo Dalton that I had amongst everyone, make it a little bit weaker. There's now a Pigo Dalton only between types. So uh, if I make transfers uh, from a richer to a poorer type, things get better. Then we need to add a reward axiom, which basically means to say we have to take a position on our attitude to inequality within types. And for this example, there are many different versions of this that we cover in the chapter. For this example, I'm just gonna use one where you're still inequality averse. You still don't like inequality, even if it's due to effort, okay? Um, then uh, uh, we, can, we can put that, that in there. And there are some other technical things that I'm not, talking about it, uh, on, on additivity and, and, and so on, uh, separability and additivity and all that. Okay, um, so it turns out, if you do replace those two axioms, one and three, with one A, one B, three A, and add this six B, you get this social welfare function, um, okay? Uh, and the point here is this thing is a transformation of that prioritarian thing that Matt showed you earlier. So there was that social welfare function, the prioritarian one, which had this concave function, right? So here you've got the same thing, except that the concave function now is within each type. I here is a type and, uh, and J is a, is a trench, is an effort level. And, and these are just population shares, these PIJs. So I'm just adding up these concave functions, but they are not the same concave function for everyone the way it was before. Now they are different. They are still concave. They're increasing and, and concave as negative second derivative. But importantly, there has always to be a little, this condition here just says that the first derivative of, the, of this thing has to be higher in the poorer types. And, and this, you could think about the math later if you want, but the intuition is simply that there is going to be inequality aversion within a type, but there's more inequality aversion between types. You care more, you're always more sensitive if you are in a poorer type. So it establishes a sort of hierarchy of inequality of opportunity within, of inequality aversion within and between types. So this is a class of um, social welfare functions, which combines elements of equality of opportunity and prioritarianism, okay? Uh, what do we do with that? Um, well, and this, uh, this looks scary. So before I go there, let me just say, um, what, what we try to do is, you know, as Matt said, there are many different functional forms for this G. You could use that, that Atkinson form or Colm Pollock or, or many others actually, logarithm, right? So what we try to do is, okay, are there conditions under which you can compare the distributions and, and always get the same ranking so that this thing would get the same ranking? And for this, we use this notion of generalized Lorentz curves. And either you know that or you don't know that in one and a half minute that I have left, I'm not gonna be able to explain it. Um, but it turns out 
that just as for prioritarianism, for that first function that Matt talked about, the one without any types, this simple one, just the concave additive increasing and concave function, um, if two distributions, two outcomes, two states of the world are like these two here in which this curve, this generalized Lorentz curve always lies above the other one, then any, any social welfare function in that prioritarian class will be better, will be happier in the red than in the blue. And it turns out there's something similar, um, drawing on an axiom by Atkinson and Bourguignon in the late eighties for the new thing that we came up with here, this, this, this uh, prioritarian, EOP prioritarian one. It's more complicated. It involves generalized Lorentz dominance within each type, and then you've got to add them across types. And, you know, so it's, it's a little funkier. And in a minute, I'm not going to be able to, to tell you that, but there are these two. Now, the question is, and with that, I'm going to end. The question is, um, are they very different? What, you know, how different is our assessment of uh, distributional outcomes if we insist on these transformations and, and move from the simple prioritarian social welfare function to this EOP prioritarian one here. And so for that, um, very much with Paula's help, we use some data from South Africa, um, which I won't explain anything in this slide, but we use some data from South Africa and we had five years. So we could compare the distribution in these five years. And that's kind of my last slide, I think. This is, uh, you know, the two comparisons. This one on the left here is checking for simple shorocks, simple generalized dominance. It's taking the South African distribution, the Lorentz dominance for a certain year, and the, uh, sorry, the generalized Lorentz curve for a certain year, the generalized Lorentz curve for another year, and it's saying, okay, 2012 was better than 2018, it was better than this one, 2014 was better than these three, 2017 was better than these three. So there was this kind of improvement. We can rank them here, we can order these things. Now, if we use that complicated thing that I had here, instead, we get exactly the same ranking. This doesn't mean that it will always be the same ranking at all. Um, in fact, there are other examples in the book in which they are not the same ranking. But in this case, it, it says that if you combine prioritarianism and equality of opportunity in this way, at least in this one application, things weren't so crazy different. So to conclude, welfareism, including prioritarianism within it, and equality of opportunity, they have different basal spaces. One looks just at welfare, the other requires knowledge about circumstances. Their rankings across outcomes will in general differ. There is an incompatibility between them that arises from clashes between the principle of reward and pure form anonymity in the transfer principle. In very simple terms, if you accept some inequalities because of effort, then it's no longer the case that you can reverse everyone in the distribution and not every people Dalton transfer will make things better. But you can restrict the domains in certain ways that you get then some sort of compromise. Um, and I showed you one kind of compromise, which is the inequality of verse reward ex ante opportunity prioritarianism. Um, specifics depend on which one you adopt. For the one that we looked at, actually the welfare rankings um, are, are, are at least in its one application, not very different at all from the standard prioritarian uh, ones. So let, let, me, uh, let me end there and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you both for your great presentations. I thought this was a very topical subject, especially given the current circumstances that we're in with the cost of living crisis that makes us think about these things on a daily basis. Um, we do have a question in the chat. It's rather a long one. Um, I don't know whether people can see the chat, but it's from Jacob, who's from Ophi in Oxford. And um, he's a participant in the inequalities program at the III. Um, so he has a question on the plausible axioms, which follow mainly Flaubert, um, the EMP article. Um, so in line with the emphasis on increasing weight with decreasing well-being, it might appear that transfer sensitivity rather than simple Pijul-Dalton could be a more appropriate axiom. 
since classic formulations of PDT would not care about the place in the distribution at which transfers take place, violating the illustrated SWF. Um, transfer sensitivity would, perhaps more elegantly, combine the weighting and the inequality aversion and thus fully axiomatize a prioritarian class of measures a question that has received some attention in the literature, so I'd be curious to hear Professor Adler and Professor Ferreira's thoughts on this. Um, shall we go with that before we go on to the second question, because that's rather a long background. Um, before we sure, I, I, can, I, can, I can take a stab in the cheek if you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, now again, Bagudalton is, is a, um, a sufficient condition for betterness, you know, and it's, um, I at least think, you know, exceedingly plausible, right? It says, if you have a pure transfer of well-being, we're not thinking about leaky transfers, but just a pure transfer of well-being from someone better off to someone worse off. I didn't add the condition that um, um, uh, 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 the transfer uh, uh, be such also that the gap between the better off and the worse off person diminishes, but that's an ethical improvement. Um, so I, I think it's very hard to, again, now we're not thinking about responsibility. Obviously, if we think that the better off and the worse of people are differentially responsible, then we move over to the whole set of issues that Chico has talked about. But with undifferentiated uh, responsibility, I take that to be very plausible. Now, of course, the question is, what do we think about leaky transfers, right? What if, um, you know, the better off one uh, loses some and the worse off one gains by less than that? That then goes to the shape of the uh, transformation function. Um, this Atkinson class, you know, this goes back to Atkinson's work on the um, measurement of inequality. Um, you get to that class of prioritarian transformation functions by, on top of the five axioms that we've been talking about, namely strong Pareto anonymity, separability, continuity, Golden. If you add a sixth axiom, which is ratio invariance, that then gets you the Atkinson form um, um, in which the degree of priority for the worse off, which is effectively your tolerance for leaky transfers is encapsulated in this gamma parameter. Um, so I have to think about how Atkinson relates to transfer sensitivity. I certainly would not want to give up the Um um I guess I have to think about how transfer sensitivity relates to you know the uh, uh, the magnitude of gamma, um, but let me let me let me stop there. Chico, do you want to add anything to that? Not really, other than than to say um, Stephen Jenkins has said in the chat that he he recalls that uh, all Atkinsonian social welfare functions um, uh, respect transfer sensitivity. The the other thing I'll just say is that I think transfer sensitivity you know, is stronger in a sense. So, so prioritarianism can live with a zero third derivative and, and transfer sensitivity cannot live with a zero third derivative. So that's why it's not needed to characterize. Now you could define a stricter form of prioritarianism where you want a zero third derivative and then you get this. Um, that, that's my sense. I haven't, you know, I may be wrong. I'd have to to do the maths properly, but that's my understanding of what of what the, the question is about. I'll stop there. And, and what about extending this to a multidimensional evaluative space? Yeah. So what? So let me let me um, I'll plug another book. Uh, <laughs> so I was privileged. Who knows? This is close to my heart. <laughs> yeah, I'll plug. So the Oxford Handbook of Wellbeing and Public Policy, which I edited with Mark Fleur Bay, uh, 2016. Um, there's a whole chapter there on multidimensional inequality metrics and poverty metrics. Um, in a way, and this goes to Chico's question, I mean, social warfare function to say, of course, people can be described in terms of multidimensional attainments, but we're going to boil that all down into well-being number and then compare outcomes, you know, in light of the pattern of well-being um, as compared to keeping separate the different multidimensional attainments. Um, again, I think the social warfare function approach is truer to the spirit of welfareism, um, but you know that's certainly something for 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 discussion. 
Stephen, would you like to um, join the discussion? You're joining it in the chat. Uh, no, I'm well, just making the point. I think that I, transsensitivity as formally defined by various people is to do with the third derivative of the the wealth SWF and in the Atkinson form, I'm sure it, it, it satisfies the right thing if it's it's got to be positive or, or non-negative, if I recall correctly. And I think the, the, all the Atkinson in, inequality indices satisfy it, but not all generalized entropy indices, inequality indices. Okay, and there's another question from Nuno. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you, uh, which concrete policies do you think that could be an application of prioritarianism? I was thinking about uh, the definition by the state of increasing minimum wage. Uh, I would like to know what you think about this. What concrete policies could be an application of prioritarianism? Well, again, what we do is, I mean, we think of prioritarianism as really a generic methodology. Um, and the implications, first of all, depend upon the policy domain. They also depend upon the degree of uh, priority, right? So unlike utilitarianism, which, which is a specific view, prioritarianism is really a whole family of views. So at the limit, if the degree of priority for the worse off becomes zero, then we have utilitarianism at the other limit with sort of, you know, infinite degree of priority for the worse off, we end up with kind of a lexim in or maxim in. So, um, you know, I can't, I'm not sure I can address that. In a way, the question is like, well, what are the implications of cost benefit analysis for a policy that, that depends? I would say the, the, the chapter which is close to the question is a chapter on, on optimal taxation, um, in which of course the use of social work functions goes back to um, at least to James Murley's. There, the authors find that, um, I guess not surprisingly, that as we shift from utilitarianism to prioritarianism, um, 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 you know, marginal income tax rates, um, I mean, the, the, roughly speaking, marginal income tax rates tend to, tend to increase. Um, uh, I don't think they look at the minimum wage. They, they do look at a sort of a, the basic grant. I think the basic grant also increases as we move from utilitarianism to prioritarianism. Uh. Maybe I just I'll add a quick thing, Kirsty, if I may, on that question. Sure. <coughs> so the, I was uh, last week at a, at a talk by um, you know J J Jim Hackman uh, talking about his uh, recent paper comparing intergenerational mobility in the U.S. and Denmark. And um, in, in that talk, he was mentioning that you know Denmark is very good at getting the same quality of education across schools to poorer people and richer people. But that still isn't enough to really increase mobility in the extent that they expected and so on and so forth. Well, my sense of prioritarianism, of course, you know, there are all the numbers you could look at and so on. But one, one way of capturing the spirit of prioritarianism is to say, well, actually, because we're giving more value to the poorest people, it would probably be justified to allocate resources to those people in excess of what is allocated to others. Um, which is also something in, in my view that you know is, is, is resonates with equality of opportunity because you might argue for both reasons that you actually need schools and investment in schools that are better for the schools that the least privileged people go to rather than the other. So equality, which is would be equality of quality of schools, would be a massive improvement on what we have today in the world, but it's actually not enough. And I think that that can be rationalized under both. EOP and prioritarian. Stephen, is your hand up from before or is there a new question? New, if I may. Okay, any, a new one, sorry, it's, go ahead, yeah. Uh, two observations, one for Matthew and one for Shiko. Uh, first, Matthew, I, it seems to me, um, generalize Lorraine's rules, that's fine. Um, but when we step out of the uh, arena of having X being income or wealth, or things, stuff gets really hard. And actually, the be interested to see the other chapters about how you develop the transformation functions for other stuff 
I mean, that would be great, uh, really interesting. So I, I just, that that's an observation um, because, uh, yeah, because of the way the tools sort of tend to work in those other areas very well. Uh, Shigo, I mean, it was great to see uh, sequential generalized Lorenz live again, um, because uh, having ap applied it to types, but the types would, uh, households differing in their so-called needs, um, so differing in household composition. So it's really interesting to see how the exact, you know, analogies that you guys have applied the same stuff as Peter Lambert and I did in our empirical applications and stuff. But my, my observation is that um, certainly for the necessary and sufficient results that Peter and I had, you require uh, agreement about the ranking of the types. And uh, so uh, in order to apply the standard stuff that develops from um, Atkinson and Bourguignon results. So that, you know, it does, it gets rid of what sort of some cardinality, but you still require some prior agreement about the ranking of the types because it's done sequentially and you've got to start with the poorest or the worst, you know, the, the people at the bottom of the hierarchy. So. Um, so that, that's just an observation or uh, I'm, 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 I'm in emptying my head while I'm listening to you guys talk. Yeah, just quickly. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So let me say, yeah. So, so in principle, we're using, um, you know, utilitarianism, prior, prioritarianism as applied to well-being, where well-being is not just income, but a function of income and other stuff like health or longevity. Um, in chapter three, the book, you know, talks about the theory of preference-based well-being measures. So one's well-being is a function not just of attributes like income and so forth and preferences. Um, and then the book focuses on two. So equivalent income um, and then von Neumann, Morgenstern utilities, both of which are sort of respect preferences, but, you know, different important respects. And then, of course, we apply priority on top of that. Now, so of course, the question is, so like, how do you choose? Ultimately, I don't, you know, in terms of axiomatics, I don't, I'm not aware of, um, strong axiomatic arguments for a certain degree of say gamma within the Atkinson. And so it's a matter of sort of thought experiments. Yep. Yeah, and for me, just, I know that we're past time. So in 30 seconds, thanks, Stephen. I think you're right. It is it is very much the same spirit. We also require that kind of ranking here, but it's a ranking principle rather than, you know, so it's still com consistent with the, um, with the anonymity of types. You just have to know how you're gonna rank them in each case and, 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 and that works. So it's very much like that, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Well, thank you all. Um, I know we're out of time, so unless there are any burning other questions, um, we'll, we'll conclude this event. Um, thank you so much to both Matthew and Chico for presenting today, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, there is a link in the chat, so if you follow that link, you'll have more information on other III events. So thank you very much to everybody for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.